tonight, Galatians 3 and verse 15. We've had a couple of weeks off. We'll remind us, uh, we'll remind each other where we are, and we'll look to the context. What we find in Galatians 3 15 is that Paul is talking about the salvation by faith in Jesus Christ, which comes by the promise made by God to Abraham, did not come by the law of Moses, of which the Jews took such pride and uh, uh, which the, they had centered their religious thoughts around, but something actually which uh, had predated the law uh, by a number of hundreds of years. So again, the, the overall uh, text and theme from chapter 1, verse 1, that this gospel Paul preached was not through the agency of men, but it was through Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead. Of course, he died, as it says in, uh, in verse 4, because he gave himself for our sins so that he might rescue us from this present evil age according to the will of God our Father. So, by the will of God our Father, Jesus came and did his work. Then we saw, as Paul developed this further in the second chapter, verse 16 we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. So also we have believed in Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law, because by works of the law, no uh, one will be justified. So we saw in chapter 3, the more immediate context. We saw that Abraham believed God in verse 6. And it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So the quote, even so Abraham believed God, and it was reckoned to him as righteousness, Genesis 15 and verse 6. So the faith that saved Abraham is the same kind of faith that we should have, and that is what is put forth as our hope. And the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify, verse 8, the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. So there's a blessing in belief. And our last lesson, a couple of weeks ago, saw that there was a curse in trying to follow the law. So verse 9 was, All who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. But, verse 10, As many are of the works of the law are under a curse. Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law, in order to perform them. So Paul sets out for us the blessing of faith and the curse of the law. Verse 11, Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, the righteous man, quoting Habakkuk, shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith, but on the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. So you can have a performance system or a faith-based system. We're all going to need the faith-based system because faith we can have and full performance we cannot, especially since we haven't performed so well thus far and all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So there is a curse of this performance system of the law. Verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law. Having become the curse for us, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the Spirit or the promise of the Spirit through faith. So us as Gentiles, not Jews, not born into that family, not born into that lineage, uh, we have the opportunity of faith in the same way as Abraham. So now that brings us to tonight's text freshly, verses 15 through 18. We have God's way the way that is by the promise to Abraham and that is not by the works of the law, the instructions of the law, and doing things that way. So Galatians 3, 15 to 18, the promise, not the law. Brethren, I speak in terms of human relations, even though it is only a man's covenant, yet when it has been ratified, no one sets it aside or adds conditions to it. Now the promises were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say, and to seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, and to your seed, 
That is Christ. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God so as to nullify the promise. For if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer based on a promise. But God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. So there's a promise or a covenant. There's a sacred agreement that God made with Abraham that in his seed all the nations would be blessed. And it's by this promise, not by the law. The law being a curse, the law being something uh, contrary to us, a burden which we couldn't bear, Peter would say to uh, the brethren in Acts 15. The law is not the way that God brought salvation. Instead, God brought salvation his way. As it says in verse 15, that God made an agreement. So, brethren, Paul says, I speak in terms of human relations. So even when it comes to men's agreements, when it comes to men's covenants or men's testaments, when it comes to the things of men, once it's been ratified, you don't set it aside or add conditions to it. And so once we've agreed on a thing, even as people, even among men, once we've agreed on a thing, the thing is the thing. And you can't say, well, we'd like it to be something else now. So we might just give two examples, which we uh, should be familiar. We think about a last will and testament, which is also in some jurisdictions uh, uh, applied the word covenant to, like we have here. We have a person who makes a, t uh, uh, a will. We have someone who uh, leaves uh, after his death uh, with, uh, certain conditions and stipulations of what should be done with various things, usually regarding property and other responsibilities the man has. And once he has made his will, his will is his will. And the people who are the beneficiaries, or sometimes those who are not the beneficiaries, they might like the will very much to say other things. And it's very hard for them to get a will changed once the will's been made. And the best hope is to prove the person who made the will was in some way incompetent, or in some way didn't follow the uh, proper ways to get a will ratified and get a will put into place. Because once a will is put in place, legally and properly so, you can't change it. The, 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 yeah, you're not going to ask the man to go back and amend it while he's alive. He, he might amend it. While he's alive, he might go back on uh, things that he has decided. But among men, once the thing's been ratified, it's been done. Same thing with uh, uh, treaties among nations. Once nations have made treaties, uh, they, they have an agreement. Or uh, in our Constitution... Our Constitution has, so far, I think, 27 amendments, if I'm remembering things properly. properly. It's not many. Uh, we do actually have a way to change our Constitution, but it's quite difficult because we don't want that being done lightly, and we don't want that being done by just whoever is in charge at the minute. We want uh, only to be changed uh, when the people as a whole, or nearly as a whole, uh, see a thing needs to be done. And so it takes uh, extraordinary efforts to change our Constitution. But because it isn't revealed of God, because it is a document of men, it can actually be changed. But even that one, we think about the great difficulty necessary. Well, in this case, the, the one making the agreement, the one ratifying uh, the agreement, the covenant, is God himself. And what would cause God to change his mind or to do something other than what he said? Well, it's not going to happen. In Hebrews chapter 6, we have this on the surety of the promises of God. Hebrews 6.13 For when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself. So here's a sworn oath to Abraham. I will surely bless you. I'll surely multiply you. And thus, having patiently waited, he obtained the promise. For men swear by one greater than themselves, and with an oath given as confirmation, is an end to every dispute. In the same way, God, desiring even more to show the heirs of the promise, the unchangeableness of his purpose, he interposed with an oath, in order that by two unchangeable things, in which it's impossible for God to lie, we may have strong encouragement. We who have fled for refuge in laying hold of the hope set before us, this hope we have is an anchor for the soul, both sure and steadfast. 
And so what we have is a way that God announced, uh, that God announced numerous times to Abraham, that God announced with promises. He backed those promises up with an oath. And here it is compared to a covenant. It is an unchangeable agreement that God made with Abraham. And we've noted that Abraham is also given as the example of the way we're saved. So in Abraham, and like Abraham, is how salvation in Christ is going to come. It's going to come in a thing that predated the law by a good number of years. Uh, similar to, uh, we won't take time to do this, but similar to the priesthood of Christ by the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek, a contemporary, uh, contemporaneous person to Abraham, a person with whom Abraham interacted as a priest of the God Most High. Uh, Christ's priesthood is in that way, predating the law uh, by a, a way not given at Sinai, but by given, given in a way of something before. So what we'll find is that the Apostle Paul will now spend the next three verses, our study, explaining about this way of God by promise and not by law. And the first thing about this is that it is a singular promise. It's a peculiarly singular uh, promise, particularly singular. It says, now the promises, so many promises, there was a lot of promises God made to Abraham. Uh, it says, were spoken to Abraham and to his seed. He does not say to seeds, as referring to many, but referring rather to one and to your seed, and Paul says, that is Christ. So here is our inspired commentary on what that promise meant. And this promise is quoted particularly from Genesis 22 and verse 15, beginning, it'll be down about verse uh, uh, 18 when we get to it, but here's, this is right after Abraham had sacrificed Isaac. Well, Isaac is still there uh, with Abraham on the mountain, uh, where he, uh, Abraham had taken him to sacrifice Abraham had showed his dedication and his faith even to begin uh, the, uh, the ritual that would result in death itself. At the last moment, he is stopped. And then God says, after this, And the angel of the Lord called Abraham a second time from heaven and said, By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you've done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son, I will indeed greatly bless you. I will greatly multiply your seed as the, uh, as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed will possess the gates of their enemy. And in your seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Now, we have this divine commentary on this passage already from Paul that the seed is... Christ. Now, this promise, uh, multiplied as the stars of heaven and of the sand of the seashore and possessing the gates of the enemy, we see that these would also likewise be fulfilled in Christ. Uh, they are also, as uh, Abraham has promised again, as God told him many times, uh, he told him in Genesis chapter 12 uh, that his descendants would be as the, uh, what would possess the land. He also told him in chapter 13 of Genesis. Chapter 15, it comes up twice in the early verses uh, around verse 5 and the later verses around verse 18. It comes up again in chapter 17, and it comes up again in chapter 21. It comes up over and over that God makes these promises. And in order to make sure Abraham believed them and, and to help him as he uh, waited patiently on the promises, God gave these additional oaths, additional uh, ways of promise, uh, God told him that your descendants will get these things. But of this, that uh, all the nations be blessed, it's only in this one, and it's only in the singular of the seed. And so in Christ, there's a fulfillment of these things, just as there were in Abraham's other descendants coming through the 12 tribes. Uh, through the 12 tribes was also fulfillment of the stars of heaven prophecy and also fulfillment of the seashore prophecy in the sand and also to, uh, to possess uh, that land where he dwells, but of the nations being particularly blessed in the singular seed is only here. And so we say that this is fulfilled, as the Apostle Paul explains it, fulfilled only in Christ, making uh, 
particular note to say this is in the singular seed, in the singular seed, the singular Christ. And this is one of the occasions where the Bible is uh, has us pay attention to uh, particular details and even small details, such as singular versus plural. Uh, we have occasion also, for instance, at the proof of the resurrection that Jesus gives, that God is the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, even though they were long dead. Not saying he was their God, but he is their God. And so the tense of the verb is used to make a, a doctrinal statement. Here, it is the singular or plural of the noun that is uh, particular. And sometimes people, uh, I think rightly so, like to point out that the Bible's literal. Because so many people don't take literal actual statements. Although I think sometimes maybe they oversell that. Because the Bible is just about as literal as we are. There's sometimes we're very literal. There's other times where we uh, speak uh, colloquially or speak in figures of speech or uh, speak in hyperbole or speak in generalities. And the Bible does exactly the same thing. But the more particular we are and the more literal we are trying to be, then the more we need to pay attention to what's being emphasized there. So yes, the Bible has non-literal things. Uh, allegory. We're going to run into an allegory before we end Galatians. The Bible has an allegory. And the, sometimes events are typical uh, or they are emblematic of a thing, as well as being actual and literal. Uh, but the Bible uh, not, doesn't just speak with rhetorical devices in apocalyptic language. Uh, but it also speaks, in these cases, in a very literal way. And so we need to find out, and, and like, especially if it's divinely explained, as in this passage, understand that uh, sometimes a, 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 a proper reading of the Scripture will be a very strict and literal one. But other times, because of different ways of use of language, uh, it'll be more general. But it's based on the same thing that we do when we communicate with each other. Sometimes we are very strict and particular. We'll give instructions and we'll say, do this and then do that and then do the other thing. And by the way, don't even think about doing that. And if somebody gives you a list, pay good attention, right? Same thing in the Bible. If a list is given. I remember I had a history professor. It's been a few years now. But I had a history professor in college. And we noticed that he, if he ever gave a numbered list, that that thing was going to be on the test. If he ever if he ever said first, second, third, or one, two, and three, write that down. He didn't he didn't uh, uh, give uh, things like that just willy nilly. And so with the scripture, when particular emphasis is given to a thing, well then take that as important. So in this case, the apostle Paul says this is a singular, and this is a Christ centered promise, a singular promise in Christ. He also says about this promise that this promise is unchanging. This promise was not a conditional one in any way. This promise was given after Abraham's obedience. That is for absolute sure. But it is stated as an absolute. Because you have offered your son, God says, I am promising you this. So if there had been any condition to it, the condition would have been met before the promise was made. He said, because you have done this very thing, not withheld your son, I indeed will greatly bless you, greatly multiply your seed, and in your seed all the nations of the earth be blessed, because you obeyed my voice. And so uh, it's given unconditionally because of who Abraham already was. And so it's not going to change. And it didn't change, even though God gave a lot of different details and a lot of important things later. Verse 17, what I'm saying is this, the law. All right, you guys, you guys in Galatia, you like that law of Moses a lot. You're telling the Christians they need to follow the law of Moses. You're telling them, like in Acts 15, 2, unless you keep the customs of, of the law, you cannot be saved. He says, I'm telling you that salvation and the blessing was promised to these Gentiles through Abraham, without that law. So we don't need that law to fulfill this promise. What I'm saying is this. The law, which came 430 years later, does not invalidate a covenant previously ratified by God. 
so as to nullify the promise. So the promise was made. There were no additional conditions uh, for Abraham to meet at this time uh, to receive that promise. The promise was made. The promise was ratified. And the fact that an additional covenant uh, to some of Abraham's descendants uh, was given that they needed to keep for God's own purpose and for their own good, as it turns out, that doesn't change the fact that the great blessing is still going to come by this promise given many, many years beforehand. A thing done 430 years later cannot possibly change the promise that God had made to Abraham. And certainly, it cannot nullify it. You know, morally and ethically, uh, we're not supposed to go back on the promises we make, uh, even if they're fresh, even if they're new much less if a promise has stood for 430 years before it was uh, uh, something else was done, uh, changed, or added. I don't want to spend much time, but just a, a brief side note. Every time we have the mention of the time in Egypt, uh, the time of the captivity and the like, and this, uh, because you know the, the law was given right after they came out of Egypt, uh, this 430 years, uh, is mentioned, and there's a, a problem with us trying to figure out exactly where Paul is counting from. We seem to know where he's counting to, which is uh, the uh, giving of the law, which was within you know just a, a month or two after coming out of Egypt. Uh, and we have a, passages such as um, Exodus, excuse me, um, uh, yeah, Exodus 20, uh, excuse me, Exodus 12 and 40. Exodus 12 and 40. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years. It seems that Paul is referencing that verse. And that verse tells us about the time in which uh, they were in Egypt from the time they went down uh, with, uh, with Israel, with Jacob as an old man. Uh, but that's, it. If, if we add up from the promise, to the law, it certainly seems to be longer than that uh, because Abraham got this promise at 115 or so. Isaac wasn't born for 45 years. Then uh, uh, Israel is not, you know, Israel is born uh, after that and uh, 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 a good bit. And then he was 130 when he goes. So there are some who think that Paul made a chronological mistake here. Uh, but... Uh, uh, I think what Paul is just mentioning is the 430 years as the the round number of time of saying when they left Egypt and got the law, not the time from this promise being given uh, to uh, the to the law being given, which actually would get us to closer to 600 years. But in any case, I just let you know there's a little bit of a question of some, and people think Paul made a mistake and the like. I think he is just referring to Exodus 12 and saying, look, it was you know, from they, it was a long time, and, and the, the the argument here is not the exact number of years, but the the sequence, with many centuries passing. There were many centuries passed, from the time the law, uh, before the law came, that this promise had been in effect. So this promise had been in effect for a long time, before the law came, and this promise given to the father of them all, uh, wasn't changed when through Moses. God gave the whole group of people uh, additional instruction and additional things they should do. And again, as we note, it's not uh, conditioned at all at this point on, on Abraham's further obedience or Abraham's further anything because Abraham had already obeyed. There are times when God gave Abraham a conditional promise. And maybe if Abraham hadn't met the conditions, uh, he wouldn't have received the blessing. Like the very first time uh, we have the uh, the promise made, uh, Genesis 12, go from your country, from your kindred, from your father's house to the land I show you. I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I'll make your name great so that you'll be a blessing. I'll bless those who bless you. And uh, him who dishonors you, I will curse. And you all the families of the earth be blessed. So Abraham went and did as the Lord had told him. Well, he he was told, if you do this, you'll get that. And he did. But later, when this is repeated, he'd already done that. 
and he'd already uh, followed other instructions as well, and after his faithfulness, with no further condition, with uh, a full ratification of God, you've done, I'll do. God promised through his seed all the nations would be blessed. And so there's nothing about the law that will change that. And as it turns out, the, the promise being fulfilled does not come through the law. A lot of good things came through the law, but through the law did not come the fulfillment of God's promise. Verse 18, for if the inheritance is based on law, it is no longer on the promise, but God has granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. And so we, we have what we have in Christ because God promised Abraham and God delivered what he promised to Abraham. The law of Moses was there for a time. The law of Moses was there for a purpose, and we'll get to that purpose. The next verse, which will be next week's study, ask us this in verse 19. Why then the law? Okay, well, Paul, what's the law about if the law isn't about salvation? Ah, the law was about hoping, uh, helping and bringing you to salvation in <laughs> numerous ways, but it wasn't about the salvation itself being offered. It wasn't about the salvation uh, coming or not. It was about uh, uh, leading you to that. So if it was based on if this inheritance, and again, uh, the inheritance of Abraham for all of his uh, descendants, but also uh, uh, those of the whole world, this great inheritance, which we have, have, have seen fulfilled in Christ, it's not based on the law. It's based on the promise. If it's based on the law, it's not on the promise. But God granted it to Abraham by means of a promise. And so one of the things we think about is Paul here argues with the Jews of his day. It's, it reminds me of something of what Jesus did as Jesus went around quoting the prophecies. They thought the law had life, but the law should have led them to Christ. Uh, both for, for Jesus and Paul, they both point that point out. But uh, Jesus is able to show, <coughs> Jesus is able to show in the prophecies in their own book that their book was about him. That's John 5, the witnesses sermon. And here the Apostle Paul is able to go back into the common family history of them all, and it's his family history too. It's the story of his great-great-great-grandpa, and their great-great-great-grandpa, and what God had done for them. And, and that's really what had marked them out as a, as a uh, honored people, as a peculiar people. This relationship they had with God from, from Abraham on, and not all of them, of course, uh, who were descendants of Abraham, uh, not those descendants of Ishmael, and in, uh, uh, not all the descendants of Isaac. For uh, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated would say you know, both testaments old and new. Uh, and then uh, it's not, so it's in their own family history. It's in their own flesh and blood. It's in God's promise to the headwaters of this entire exercise that this comes. And so in some ways they sort of acted like it all, it all started with, with, uh, with Moses. But it didn't start with Moses. It started back, back hundreds of years before that. It started back with the first father of this entire tribe. It started with Abraham. And Abraham lived by faith. And Abraham also had circumcision. And, you know, they, they thought of those, they thought uh, in their view that uh, the things that uh, made a man right were circumcision and following the law. Well, uh, one of those, they kind of were not quite square on it because even under the law, the just would live by faith. But even that great rite of circumcision, uh, which was kind of their, their you know, national emblem more than just about anything else, that predated the law too. So the promise and the things that they had thought were important, uh, some of them predate the law. And other things which came in the law, uh, they thought, it, it almost as it were, uh, that it would uh, supplant the law, or excuse me, supplant the promise. But the law in no way supplanted the promise. The promise was this singular one, who was going to come through Abraham, who was going to be a blessing to everybody. And that's where we have Christ. And the rest of this chapter, 
we're going to start explaining about the law, and then it's going to say that we now have come directly to Christ. And we who have been baptized into Christ and been put on Christ, clothed ourselves with Christ, we are now the descendants of Abraham by this promise. And so we're not descendants of Abraham by family connection like these Jews were, but we're of the same faith, of the same spirit uh, as Abraham and in the promise of Abraham. So God's promise, singular, not through all those that kept the law, but through Christ. Unchanging, even though there was a law given many, many centuries later, and it wasn't that law. It was that original promise uh, that was so important to the uh, fulfillment of these things through Jesus Christ.